leaders were Africa today on are we transforming? And the main aim is to discuss what was on his mind when he came up with the album Rise. Um, the song that we're playing, half of it, is actually called Vuga. So I thought the topic that we can discuss today will be Vuga Africa. And I'm sure he's gonna do justice to that because when you listen to the entire album Rise, it's actually about Africa, we are all Africans and so forth. So yeah, this is an honor MD, to have you on the Awe Transforming platform, uh, the platform which I give every citizen, an African citizen or South African citizen to come and share their views about how can we build the Africa that we all want. Identifying gaps, you know, um, areas of improvement and where possible come up with solutions. Then I will sit and draft the report, then share with different stakeholders. So I'm sure with your experience, your, yeah, your many titles, you're going to do justice to this topic. And this is the last um, session of the year. I was so excited when you said yes. So yeah, welcome to Are We Transforming. Thanks very much for having me and inviting me on your platform. And uh, I'm just looking forward to sharing good music and uh, um, talking about Africa. What can we do for Africa? And uh, moving forward as Africans, what can we do to transform ourselves and our society and the continent at large? Wow. <laughs> Short and sweet. Who are you? Me, I'm... Um, uh, um, I was born in a, a small village in Bushpark, which is called Bambayan. So that's where I was born and raised, but everyone is still there. So I was um, the second born in a family of four boys. So um, we grew up, growing up in a village, you know, it's always a struggle. So we're always looking forward to, to come to the city, the city of gold more especially. But for me, you know, growing up in a village where there's nothing more to do except playing soccer and music and reading books. So I fell in love with uh, books, you know. Um, uh, I started reading when I was young. I, and then I came across music. I used to be a member of a church choir. I wrote my first song when I was 11 years old. So, and then, my church choir members encouraged me to write more songs because they liked the song that I wrote. So um, I wrote my first poem when I was 13 years old. You know, I was part of, um, I can see that my eyes were open at a young age for me to see, mm -hmm. to join the struggle. You know, at the time in South Africa, things were very bad. You know, we had the apartheid regime and even though we're in the village, we will feel it, you know, because it was all over us, South Africa. So I wrote my first poem titled The Tears of a Blind Man, you know. Basically, for me was to, if you could sit with a blind man at the time, explaining to the, that blind man because he couldn't see the situation of what was happening in South Africa at the time, mm. the blind man would break down and cry. So that was the poem all about, you know, that mm. the situation there could even make a blind man cry. So that inspired me to write my first poem. And I never looked back, you know, uh, from village, you know, I moved to Jobeka. The, the rest is history, so they say. Yeah, the rest is history, but people do not, okay, people know you because many people, when they saw your, your pamphlet that I was advertising and they, um, they realized that it's you, they started sending me WhatsApp messages. Who is this person? How do you know this person? We know him to be this famous person. Why do they consider you famous? What is it that you do other than what you have just told us now, which makes you famous? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think, I don't think, I think, uh, I, I mean, famous is, fame, famous is a very, it's a very, it's a very, it's a, I mean, the guy would think, like, for example, if you, if you see someone three times per week on, uh, on the street, are they famous? See someone once per year on TV, are they famous? So it, it, 
describing the word famous is a really subjective, so to speak, you know. Yes, I mean, I had a TV show on uh, Major Moja Love, like Channel 157, three years ago, uh, but it's still on repeat now. People still seeing it and they think it's a new show. The show ended three years ago. I know I'm, I'm an award-winning journalist. I've been writing stories for the past 20 years or so. So people know me as a journalist. They know me as a TV presenter. They know me as a, a, a songwriter and musician. They know me as an author. My, my memoir was one of the best-selling books in South Africa, you know? So so a lot of things that I've been doing, I'm, I'm an artistic, so I only do things that is art. You know, I'm a creative person. I write, I make music. I write as a journalist. I'm now I've ventured into movies, you know? So he said, everything that has got art that is challenging me creatively, I want to get myself involved in. Wow. <laughs> That is really uploaded. Um, I actually get to also understand because after they asked me, I started um, researching and, and checking what is it that actually is. And I found a whole lot of articles, many of those which will be considered as controversial sometimes, not controversial in terms of them not being relevant, but asking questions which many people will shy away from. I think that will also bring us to the topic of today. Rise, which is your album. And then you have Africa as one of the first titles. And along the way, there is one that is saying, we are all Africans. And then there's VUCA, which is my favorite um, album. Out of all those that I have mentioned now, my, my view will be, there's a need for Africa to rise, but it's a cliche kind of a, everybody will say that um, Africa must rise, but what does that mean to you? And probably what is it that you can tell us for us to also rise as Africans? Okay, see the issue is not every day when the sun rises, everyone is awake. Some people are awake, but still asleep. So Arise the album is for, those who are half asleep to say, wake up, see what is happening in your Africa. What can you do to make it a better Africa? What can you do to take this message to the next person and to the other next person? So basically Rise is saying, wake up politically, spiritually, and as a human being, you know, most people say the beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord. Yeah. I'm saying the beginning of wisdom is to know who you are. If you don't know who you are, how can you fear the Lord? First, you have to start with yourself. You have to wake up so you can know there's a Lord. Yeah. You have to know yourself so you can answer to someone's name. So for me, rise is like rise up as an African. Stand up for what you believe in. Tell the other person so they can join you. And if you rise up, if you look at the cover of Rise, it's, it's a baoba tree. Yeah. If we all rouse up together, we stand together, we become a strong fist that not even the strongest wind will shake us. So that's why the concept Rise. Let us all rise, let us all unite, let us stand together and move forward to make Africa a better place that we want it to be. Okay, in your view, I believe the reason why you wrote this because you saw something that made you to believe that we are not as united as we're supposed to be. What are those things that you have identified which led you to writing these things? Because for me, more especially VUCA, it's a reminder. It talks about me seeing somebody who is being beaten, but I'll keep quiet. Or me seeing somebody killing the other person, I'll not even call the police, I'll just run for my life. Yeah, you know, those kind of things. Family no longer becoming that place of safety because people get beaten through gender-based violence. What are those things that made you, over and above that which I'm mentioning, that made you to think, no, Africa is not as united as it's supposed to be, and as such, possibly is not as awake as it should have been, or it should be. So things that really pushed me to write the, the song uh, Voga was tribalism, xenophobia, political intolerance, 
and also undermining each other as Africans, you know. The issue is, again, coming off from a village, you know, in a village, everyone, every person, every man and a woman is your mother and father, regardless whether you are related to them or not. If someone wants to send someone to the shop to buy the bread, you stand by the street and say, child, they say, hey, what's that? And they'll send the child to shop because everyone in the village is a child to stay. If you are in the village, you are a, a child of the entire village, mm. and you respect everyone equally. When someone uh, asks you, you don't ask them, what's your surname? Where were you born? Do you speak Zulu or speak Sotho? Do you speak Tsonga? You answer to that, and you do as you are told by your elders. You don't question, say, oh, you're not my father, you're not my brother, you're not. So I come in from the village. I wish everyone would have that concept that Every elder is your mother and the father. Every man and woman, every boy and a girl is your sister and brother, regardless of their age, regardless of the language they speak, regardless of where they were born, uh, regardless of what political party they support, regardless of what pol uh, religious uh, uh, religion they follow. So if we can cut all those uh, BS that divide us, those those isms like uh, uh, like being uh, tribalism, xenophobic, uh, being uh, uh, this person uh, it doesn't speak my language. Mm. It's not the language that makes us together. It's the body, the blood. Our blood is one. Our continent is one. So I, I was trying to say, like you see, until the day we differentiate between a tourist and an African, until we define that to the bottom, that's when we'll understand. That's when we'll stop hating ourselves, we'll stop hating each other and harming each other because, oh, this one is, um, is uh, Gwere Gwere. So people, they say, it's, it's bad. You call your own brother a Gwere Gwere. Yeah. Where does that come from? Who taught you that because this brother was born on the other side of the fence? I was born on the other side of the, of the world. Does it make me different from you? Mm -hmm. Because there's a world that divides my family and yours. Because there's a world, a fence that divides your country and mine. Does it make us not brothers and sisters anymore? Who put those barriers? Was it my mother and your mother? Was it us? Someone put those barriers and tried to divide and conquer. And we fall on that trip. And we start calling each other names. We start killing each other because someone said, this one, it's a, it's a Zimbabwean, this one is a Mozambican, this one is a Swati, this one is so-and-so. And we believe that instead of looking, that's why I always say when people, uh, every time I post a, a proverb, someone said to me, well, we, which country is this proverb from? I said, it's an African proverb. <laughs> because for me, I believe in an Africa as, as a united Africa. I don't believe in us dividing ourselves like slice of bread to say, oh, this is, uh, this is this, this is this. I think if we can stop looking at other as I'm Nigerian, I'm Ghanaian, I'm uh, Malayan, or whatever, we look at other as Africans mm. and start understanding each other, our history and politics. Because how should I understand the politics of Nigeria when I hate a Nigerian? First of all, I need to love my brother and ask him, brother, how are you today? What's happening in your country? What did your president do for you and your people? What's the burning issue where you are, where you are from? So we start debating this thing as a collective Africans, not me standing on the fence and say, hey, hi, Maki, uh, what is that, you know? Yeah. So the concept of unity, that's what all our founding fathers of all different African countries, they've been fighting for African unity. That's why Af uh, the organization of uh, African Union was born, to forge unity amongst Africans. Mm -hmm. But how many years it's been taking them to still to this day, we're still not united, which is the sad part. Wow, so, okay, let's start from, from South Africa. South Africa has got laws. Um, I heard on the news, was it yesterday, that a Zimbabwean who've got some permits which are expiring, are going to be taken home, blah, 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 all those kind of things. 
how do we balance between me wanting to be a, a you know treating my fellow brother or sister the same way i would treat a south african who is coming from outside of south africa uh, uh, you know treating them the same way when the laws are actually saying to us they don't belong here how do we balance because i think that is one of the reasons that makes us now to feel as if they are not part of us things like they are coming to take our jobs things like um the other time we were we, we, uh, engaging this this uh, gentleman who said they are good at at selling when it comes to retail they are one of the best um, they do this thing with their eyes closed competing with them will be like killing your business and it, it's either you find a way of working with them or partnering with them but what happens is People in townships, for instance, will, will fight them because they are perceived to be taking our job. And the laws in our country, for instance, in South Africa, it will say, no, 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 no. We, we cannot be held ransom by these people, these people. And this is said on national TV, everybody listening. What perception, you know, I think that is what mold us. What advice would you give and how do we balance, you know, listening to our leaders saying those words and also having to be sisters and brothers to the fellow um, African brothers who are in our country. Okay, first of all, we must know that there are rules and regulations that every Tom, Dick and Harry must follow. Yeah. Like, for example, when I go to a country, I need to submit my passport, uh -huh. first of all, okay? They will ask you how long are you staying, 30 days, where is, you know, all those things. So the issue is we need to follow the rules and regulations and respect a constitution of what particular country. So the issue is people are saying Nigerians are drug dealers. South Africans, they also got South African drug dealers as well. <laughs> That's a fact. We've got South Africans who are drug dealers, are well-known drug dealers. So what are we saying about it? So the, the issue here is we use, we are hiding behind our thumbs. We, we try to avoid to look at the bigger issues. Okay, the issue here is everywhere you go, you need to be, okay, there are people who are in this country because they run away from a war torn zones. Mm -hmm. They do need to accept that. Yeah. It was, they had to run away because their families and relatives were being killed. We need to accept that. There are those who came from, their, left their countries to South Africa because of economic issues. Mm -hmm. So when, like for example, if I were to go somewhere and pay Lobola for someone to become my wife, I need to respect that family. I need to go there and show myself and say, I seen your daughter, I want to extend my hand in marriage. They'll give me their rules and regulations. This is how we do it mm -hmm. for you to become our son-in-law. And until I fulfill those things, I'm not going to be called their son-in-law. Mm. So the issue is there are rules that need to be followed. Some might be not as pleasant as you want them to be. But for you, if you really love that person, if, even if they say 100 cows, you'll kill those 100 because you love that woman. So all I'm saying is there are rules, some of them might not be what our brothers and sisters who are in South Africa, what they would like them. Mm. But there are rules that they must observe and respect. Sure. That, yeah. That's the thing. But again, there are also political issues because some some of brothers are in South Africa, are in, here, are in exile because they're running away from political violence in their countries. Some of them are political activists, and they are wanted in their countries. Mm. So when you are here, how do you then continue with your struggle? That you left home, you're coming here to push that struggle. You can push that struggle as long as you respect the constitution of where you are pushing their struggle from. Mm. For example, South Africa, we know most South Africans were in exile. There were a lot of African countries that help us. Most, like if you go to Tanzania today, we sing the national anthem. We go to Tanzania today, you'll see um, 
our 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 our, our, our freedom fighters have left their families up there. You go to Zambia, it's the same thing. You go to Mozambique, it's the same thing. Um, to an extent, in Lesotho and Zimbabwe, it's all the same thing. They have they contributed one way or another in our struggle. Mm. But the issue is, when our our freedom fighters were in exile, they were documented. They knew if today someone is, co is coming here looking for Mziligas, they will take you exactly where Mziligas is. Yeah. Like now, if someone coming here looking for certain, we don't even know where they are. Who is to be blamed? It's our system. Our government didn't create a system whereby they will make sure that everyone entering here is documented, is known to be, this person is going to be residing there and they'll be working here. Yeah. So who do you blame? Uh, so, so. Do, you, do you blame your visitor if they come here, they find your house is, 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 is dating? No. So you now say, oh, you, blame, you brought that in my house. They found your house dating. You need to clean up and own up. That is true. That is true. Okay, let me allow uh, if there are any questions or comments from those who are attending, I'll also check on Facebook if they are people who are um, okay. All right. Uh, Matume, do you have any question or comment? or any contribution, that would be actually appreciated. Okay, one is still unmuting. Oh, there he is. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to ask a question, not a question per se, but to give a comment. Mm. Because the what is being said by the speaker and thanks to Mzi Wa Africa for this uh, delivery. Because it's true in our societies, we don't, uh, we don't respect our fellow brothers and sisters. We look at them as, like he was saying, calling them names. Those are our fellow brothers and sisters. As Africans, the reason we are um, not respected by the, the other continents or other outside world is because we, we have lost respect for ourselves and for our fellow neighbors, which, which they imposed on us as colonialists. Mm. So it is a very profound message. And that's how I, I, I always, when I meet them, I do treat them well, uh, you know. Mm. Uh, basic, Basically, for that purpose, they are my fellow brothers and sisters. They, they didn't choose to be here by choice. It is um, uh, um, circumstances that force them in most uh, instances. So if you put them yourself in their shoes, there's no other way you can treat them well, because if you were to be in their land, You'll, you'll expect to be treated in the same manner. Okay. But um, it's a very profound message. It, it will take us a long way if we just change attitude towards these brothers and sisters from across countries um, and to know who we are and love ourselves more uh, as, as Africans mm -hmm. and not... not uh, we regard ourselves as second fiddle to other races. Uh, it's really, it's a mockery on, uh, to our ancestors who fought so bitterly for this land, for our freedom. So we should cherish being African. It's the best thing one can be. Thank you, uh, Mzi. Thank you, host. Thanks. Much appreciated. Z, um, the the comment right now actually take us to the to the track which says we are all Africans, and I think you have allude, alluded to the fact that we should treat each other equally. I read somewhere it says um, the best, the greatest treasure and wealth Africa has is its people. 
do it and it's really culture yeah. it's people and it's culture yes <laughs> we really consider ourselves as the wealth of africa or we always focus on the minerals that we have do we do we really consider ourselves as that we are all africans yes and i think we we can we can do a whole lot more that will put africa on a different on a different level but do we consider ourselves as that so um, first of all you know as long as we are chasing material things we will lose focus on what is real mm. what is real is our continent our land as long as we don't have our land back we can shout and scream so we need our land back first with we have our land back first we can be able to dance on it to plow on it so we can fight poverty on it so like now the levels the the the, the, the playing field is not level because i'm standing on here like i think uh, someone said that like i'm standing on a ground where I'm a tenant in my own in my own country, mm. while someone else is not, and this is not his country. Mm. How did how did that happen? How do we allow that? So, for example, someone will come here and say, "Okay, uh, I'm buying this place. We are good at selling our land, our souls." and ourselves to strangers instead of preserving and saving what we have for our children and our grandchildren and the future. Africa has been sold slice by slice by different politicians to different buyers, different colonizers, different missionaries and all of that. It's time that we reclaim what is ours, bring it back to us, and then decide as now that we have this, what do we do with it? Mm. So are we trying to get back our land so we can kill each other or are we trying to get back our land so we can grow, plow, be happy on it? It's up to us to decide. I've been to more than 20 countries across Africa. I've been, I've been treated very well in places where people don't even know who I am, where I come from. No one called me names. I can tell you that. I've been, I've been to more than 20 African countries. I've been treated very well. Like, you look at me, I'm dark. People don't think, when they look at me, they don't think like I'm South African. <laughs> so I've been called a query in my own country. And I like, because I'm darker, I'm from Bushwa, Greece. I've never been called names in any other African countries I've been. I've been, like, I'm, I've been to more than 20 countries. I stayed in villages, cities, and towns. No one mistreated me. And then I also think traveling is the best education. If many of us are able to travel outside the borders of South Africa, they will understand why we have many of our African brothers from other countries here in South Africa, because they have still have seen, observed, and witness what is happening in other African countries. Mm. So it's lack of knowledge, lack of education. People think because they've got an, a degree, a PhD, you are educated. No, you are not. Until you know who you are, where you come from, who are your brothers and sisters, then you are not educated, no matter how many degrees you've but got. One of my questions, because one of the questions was, we are acquiring all these qualifications and they say that developing Africa is will require knowledge, right? Um, will require us, uh, you know, knowing each other, like you're saying. I was reading a small article. And, and we have elevated qualifications to a point where it defines us. Is that how we want to rise? because i think we're adopting too much western westernized um cultures or approaches but we <clears throat> excuse me we don't necessarily we don't necessarily uh what's the word we don't necessarily understand 
how we can be able to use the skills we have. Because I believe in villages, like you coming from a village, there are people who know what to do specific things or who have been doing specific things or even running businesses without all those PhDs and masters. Um, do we really do we really have the or, or maybe let's start by asking what will be the approach of educating each other on on becoming the Africans that would appreciate who we are and not be defined by our qualifications? Um, the pyramid. The people who build the pyramid donkeys years ago, did they have PhD degree in engineering? Exactly. If they manage to build a structure that is still standing today without the degrees that we are flaunting around, what stop us from progressing going forward? Having a driver's license doesn't make you the best driver in the world. <laughs> it's the skills. It's the skills that we have when you are sitting behind the wheel that makes you the best driver not the license that you are holding. That's where we are missing. We think by us being in possession of something, it means it elevates us to another level. You can have all the degrees in the world, but if you don't have the knowledge, the wisdom, and the understanding, yeah, it's good as illiterate. Mm. So, so the issue is, yes, we need, you you need the knowledge to know what to do you need the knowledge to know this is my right hand this is my left hand mm. but like you look at our history oh it is always oh, oh, history has always been an oral history that has been passed by generation to uh, from generation to generation by our elders mm. most of it was not documented in, in black and white but most most of it even though it's not documented in any book form is still alive today mm. because it's been passed from one generation to the next which shows you that you don't need necessary it's not that the book that opens your eyes is the knowledge people think having all the books in front of them they've seen it all they've got have it all but if you don't know you don't know how to apply the wisdom you've acquired at school. You don't have the knowledge of connecting the dots from the books that we have in front of you. It's useless. Okay, that brings me to the point of acquiring land. With all these degrees and all these educated people, not only in South Africa, in Africa, um, one Cameroonian said in one video of 90 Minutes in Africa, said, we all have these degrees, MBAs, but our private sector is in shambles, not especially in the African country. We all have these chemical engineering, uh, you know, uh, qualifications, but we can't even manufacture a granite, a granite, he said, or even a weapon for us to use. Then we acquire this land. Are you confident that we'll be able to to do justice to what or plow the land, let me or work the land if we, we, we happen to get it back. Or there's a need for us to partner with those who have been using the land prior to us being uh, given it being given back. So in 1999, around June, I went to Dubai for the first time. It was a desert. <laughs> Today I go to Dubai, I'm like, what happened to the to the desert that was there in 1999? It's the wisdom of the leadership that transformed that desert into the world's most sought after tourist destination in the world today that Dubai is. Mm. So the issue is the guys had the land, it was a desert. But the leadership said we can turn this desert into something else something that we can be proud of something that we can show to the world that regardless of where geography has put us but our skills knowledge and expertise can put us on the on top of the world map that's what dubai is today from being a desert to the most beautiful place one of the most beautiful places under the sun today.
So are you saying what stops that? Key? Sorry? Are you saying that leadership is key towards us? Leadership. That was done by the leadership in that region. Because they had good leadership who were visionaries, mm. who saw what is needed for their people to rewrite history on the world books. The leadership decided for us to move forward, for us to be globally known and recognized, we need to do something outside our circumstances. Mm. And you look, for me, I always say, for me, it's a classical example. When I look at Dubai today, at the Dubai I went to in 1999, it's something completely different. Creativity. It's, it's good leadership and good visionaries mm. coming together mm. for their people, not for their stomachs. That's what happened. Let's talk about the stomachs. Uh, okay, I'll talk, let's talk about the stomachs, then I'll take uh, Mr. Mabo. What is it with the stomach of Africans that makes it difficult for Africa to to rise the way you and you have said it should rise in your album. Are we too hungry to a point that we forget that we we need to <laughs> to take the seeds and plow them in order to you know harvest next time? What is it that we can do to stop that? It's not we are that are we too hungry? We are too greedy. That's the way the problem is. We are too greedy. Mm. People they come and they have dinner on your table and they want to take your tablecloth, teaspoons, and forks afterwards. <laughs> we don't have good table manners. I I I'll say that you know, even if the lion is hungry, don't eat grass. Yeah. So don't change your principles just because your stomach is empty. That's what the problem is. Most people, most politicians, that's why in most African countries, the people who are winning elections are the most corrupt ones because they know how to bribe people with bags of millimeters, bags of rice, tin of fish, and all of that to win an election. And how long will they last? They will last for five years. That tin of fish, how long would it last to last for less than 24 hours in your stomach? And then that tin of fish has given someone five years term of office. They will stay for five years to continue stealing. That's what the problem is. If we can put our food down, say enough is enough. We don't need, we don't need the bag of millimil. We don't need the whatever you, we need to see deliver. We need to see roads being built. We need to see hospitals being built. We need to see people working. But now, because I know I had, I had a similar experience I, in my village. Like, I can't remember what year was it. When January 8th was in Pumalanga, you know? Yeah. So, and that December was in Pushpak Ridge. So, comrades came to me and said, hey, uh, comrade, we are preparing to go to January 8th. I said, I'm not going. I said, why? I said, show me one thing that these comrades have done in this village. The school that we have in our, my village was built by uh, the Gazankul homeland at the time. There's no single clinic since 1994. There's no road that has been, we're still using gravel roads. There's no single clinic. At the time, we didn't have running water. I, 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 I had to drill water. It cost me about more than 100,000 to drill water to the level where I was told that this is the level where the water won't get finished. And I was the one who was supplying my fellow villagers. So if I, as a private citizen, managed to spend 100,000 rand to drill water and supply my people around me, what stopped our government, which has got all the resources and the money to do the same, to drill maybe 10 boreholes around the village to service the community. So I, that's what I said to the guys, said, guys, I'm not going. This is not what we fought for. This is not what the struggle was all about, that only the elite and the few must live a better life. We fought the struggle for everyone, every South African to live a better life. And I said to them, 
And therefore, comrade, I'm not going to this January 8th. As much as it's here in our, in our province, I'm not going. Mm. It's a matter of principles. Principle, yeah. Principle. True. Mr. Mabobo? Uh, good afternoon, Tim. Mzilikas, good afternoon, yes, my friend. Yes, sir. Afternoon. <laughs> I've had the privilege of following your writings. Uh, <clears throat> and it's also a privilege to hear you talk. Um, I want to add on and echo on what you're saying about the issue of leadership. And I think I have uh, mentioned it several times in one of those platforms is the platform that Tembi has offered us. Mm. You see, when you look at the manifestos of our ruling parties, uh, let me speak about South Africa because now I'm based in Zambia. If you read and you read everything that is in there, you will not pick an item in any of their manifestos that talk to the continental free trade, the, the integration of, of Africa. You will not see any alignment of any of the manifestos. Start with the ruling party. The manifesto is not aligned to the Agenda 2063, which our, our president was a chair <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the Africa Union. So now, are we living in isolation? When else our leaders, when they go and sit in the AU, they say, this is the Africa we want. The problem comes down to what you have said, Mzirigas. Uh, when they come back home, the priority is the manifesto. They've promised people that this is what we're going to do. I was speaking in the Ministry of Social Development uh, platform in South Africa one day and said, social development ministry has become ministry of grants and nothing else. But we forget that the social ills in any society is first and foremost caused by hunger. Now, if you take your social workers, push them into the prisons where most of the prisoners are jailed because they've stolen food, and they go and speak to them and they reincorporate them into society through farming, won't that change the challenge that we have? But because we are looking at addressing this quick, rich, uh, get rich quick scheme, I have my people, I will do this. That is where the challenge is, the issue of leadership. Dubai, you gave a good example. It's selfless leadership saying, I want to transform for generations to come. Mm -hmm. Now, we treat politics as if it's chiefdom, where as a leader, I will want those that are in my family to take my position once I have left. And that is where the challenge is. I want, we have members of members in organizations today. We don't have members of organizations because most of the ideals are no longer represented. So let me come back again uh, to the recent local government elections. Are we going to get service delivery for our people with the coalitions that have happened? Because if you look at it, it's about I'm in, I have a salary for the next five years. It's not about we are going to render any service. It, you've seen the egos, the way they were flaunted when people were contesting. It was not about people first. It was about me first. And if you hear our politicians talk, then you realize we are far from getting to the Africa that we really want, the Agenda 2063. You mentioned that you have been to more than 20 African countries and not a single country has mistreated you. I'm based in Zambia now. There is not a single day where I have been asked where I come from. I'm, I'm treated as a human being with warmth, with smile. They will pick it up in the accent. Are you, are, oh, are you from South Africa? Yes. Oh, wow, what a wonderful country. <laughs> but are we doing that? Because the dictates of continental free trade are saying free movement of goods and services, including people, to trade. But politicians are saying we want foreigners to get out of Johannesburg. And yet that is the economic hub of Africa. Why are we not addressing that particular issue and remind our people that South Africa was discovered because of trade? Mm. The Netherlands, when they were going, the Dutch East India Company, 
was discovered. It was trade the way after. So now we have taken the issue of trade. Tembi, you were asking the issue, yeah, are we going to be able to utilize the land if we get it? If I remind you that in Zimbabwe, when it was Ian Smith, white farmers were not just having the skill. The first 10 years, they were being capacitated. Government put resources in capacitating them. That's why they are the so-called good farmers. They did not start as good, as good farmers. The reason why a black person today, when he sits and he looks at a farm and will not farm, is because of the history attached to that. Parents were slaves in, our far, in the farms. So we resent farms because of the history that is attached to it. But there is nothing that will stop a black child if trained to know what to do on that farm. So we should not utilize the issue and have an excuse, yeah, they will not know what to do with it. Give it back and give me the support that goes with it. Have leadership that aligns and say, this is where Africa says it's going. Let us align our manifestos. Let our people look at the agenda 2063 and the manifestos and ask the leaders, where are you taking us? Because we don't see you aligned to the Africa we want, agenda 2063. So how are we going to trade with our neighbors if we are saying people must go back? Mm. It's a question I'm posing. <laughs> Maybe okay. Mzilikas Thanks, will help answer it. Yeah. Yes, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a good question that needs a, a really answer. But my, 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 my contribution to it, like you said, uh, you said this, uh, it's no longer, people are no longer members of a political party that are members within members. So someone will come <laughs> to they, a rally. They are members they say, of, of, of a member. <laughs> there are members of a member of a party, so they are not members of a party. They support that individual. So, because that individual is taking good care of them, tenders through tenders or whatever, jobs, government jobs and whatever. So, like today, if you was to stand up and so, but this person, this particular minister or this particular president, what he's doing is wrong. You'll have all the press singers who are benefiting from all the wrong things that he's doing, insulting you on social media and all the platforms that they can get because they're defending their stomachs. They're not defending principles and, and they're not defending anything else. They're defending where their bread is coming from, where, the, where their bread is buttered. That's where the problem is. People defend their bread and sell out their own people their own principles. Mm. That's where the problem, our biggest problem is politics of the stomachs. Is it a South People, African problem or is it also an African? It's an African, it's an African problem. It's an African problem. Like you go out there and ask yourself, why is this guy still a president? You will say, hey man, you know, he came here with a truck full of, uh, of maize meal and he gave us, so what can we do? Yes. That's so the problem. Is poverty is because we, because of the, that's why if you look at, I think the local government election that Jawa has mentioned, if you look at it exactly, is the people in the cities who are like now, not depending on the hands up from politicians, who can vote for whatever party they want to vote for. Mm. So until we get, so that's why politicians are trying very hard to keep people in chains, so they can control them. They can tell them, vote for me, so that next, after five years, I'll come back with another loaf of bread for you. Not that tomorrow I'll come back with another loaf of bread. That's what they're saying. So keep people in chains in poverty, so you can keep them as your slaves and you become their master. For how long? <laughs> That's the question. The people, people don't want to free themselves. People want to see their chains made comfortable, not their chains being taken away from them. It's like most people, fear, fear is the biggest thing. I think uh, Jimmy Lavigne put it this way, that if we can be able to change that fear, not to push you from behind, but you stand in front of that fear and say, I'm, I'm taking you fear head on. To never, that fear, that's why people would be afraid to start their own business. Say, 
What if I feel I'm going to pay my medical aid and all of that? So that fear is forcing people not to achieve or to go as far as they want. People say, okay, what if we vote Chebi? Will Chebi still give us the bread that we're getting from this other guy? That's the problem. It's fear. Fear yeah. of the unknown. Mm. And politicians are very good at using that fear to, manu to manipulate people to gain votes and to stay in the office, to continue looting and continue looking after their own people. Mm. Mm. Not looking after the entire country. We were, we were having Mr. Mashamba on the 16th, uh, the day of reconciliation, and the, the, the topic was, are we transforming? He mentioned yes. something quite interesting that when he was he was young, he could not, I recognize you, uh, Mr. Mabobo, I'll come to you. He said he could not speak facing his, his father on his face, like he could not have eye contact. Yes. Because that would be considered as disrespect. A disrespect, yes, yes. And, and in the process, he became so afraid of raising his views that he will, he will complain on the side. Because my question was, why is it that as Africans, whether it's in, in, a, in at work or in corporate or government, um, or even in political organization, well, I'm not really that active, but I, I've noticed that people will murmur and complain on the side, but they go there and say, yes, sir. No, that is okay, sir. Um, it's fine. Oh, keep quiet. If you want the <laughs> rise as you you are saying in your album to what extent are we supposed to get out of that culture because it's a cultural thing and it's not only an african cultural black cultural thing even even i, I think in countries i think what you're raising that whole issue that uh, we grew up in a culture the your generation the generation of us we grew up in a culture where like we'll uh, we'll be afraid to look at the, our dads in the face and say whatever is in our mind uh, but the young generation, forgive my friend uh, my French, they don't give a shit. If if thing is wrong, they will say it. This is wrong. They will say it straight to your face. They will point fingers at you because they've realized that our generation has been said, yes, sir, yes, sir. Now they're saying, you touch us, we'll kick you. Mm. So we grew up in that generation of respect but how do you continue respecting someone who does not respect you so the new generation have realized that these guys we have seen them respecting this guy and this guy does not respect them why should we respect him if he does not being respected by this person so that's why they're standing up like if you look at them you look at for example i give you a, a history of senegal in senegal it was the youth that changed the shape of of, uh, of political uh, landscape in, in, in Senegal, where the youth came out together and to say, we are taking out this president. We are tired of this nonsense. And the youth came up in numbers and changed the landscape politically in, in Senegal to this day. It's the youth, because this is their future. Mm. And the youth are tired of standing, waiting for their fathers and mothers to change things for them. And they've realized that their fathers and mothers are running a losing battle. Now they are coming in and they are coming in to kick us. Do we see the same thing in South Africa because they don't even participate much in politics or even go to vote? The youth in South Africa, yeah. if, 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 if we were to be given the number of youth that voted in this local government election, I'm saying that my son voted for the first time this year. It, he woke up, he said that we are going to vote. Yeah. I took him. To this day, I never asked him who he voted for because I, I believe in his own judgment. My son, let me give you an example. My son, when he was at the primary school, so there's a family meeting. So we go there, they say, um, the family meeting has been called because a teacher was fired by the department. One of the kids wrote a letter to the department exposing this, teacher as being a racist African because he was an African's teacher. They read the letter in front of everyone. At the end, when they said the name of the children, I realized it was my son. And he didn't even tell me 
that he wrote a letter to the department that even got a teacher fired. I only learned about it in that meeting with everyone. Wow. And you can imagine. Yeah. And that was primary school. I'm talking about primary school, not high school. It was at a primary school. So the issue is we need to teach our kids to stand up, to stand up for themselves, to defend things when they see it's wrong. So my son did that because he has seen the struggle that up. I, that's what I taught him. Yeah. That don't allow someone, don't turn the other cheek. There's nothing like that in real life. In fantasy, yes, turn the other cheek. That's fantasy. <laughs> in real life, don't do it. And that's why I'm urging people, don't turn the other cheek. Mm. Mm. Mr. Mabogo, so, um, yeah. can finish up while we... we so the, the issue I'm saying is that the point is, I, to this day, I've been asked my son, who did he vote for? Because I trust his judgment. Mm. That is so true. Mr. Mabobo, this is quite interesting. <laughs> Mr. Mabobo. <laughs> yeah, no, I wanted to come in. I don't want to lose the thought uh, in, in, in what has just come out. I want to go back a little bit to when is it going to end where we have leaders that are continuing to, to take us for granted with everything. You know, the, as, for, as long as Tembi, our um, economic development is driven by government, there will never be an end to this vicious cycle. Um, I'll use South Africa again as an example. <clears throat> Any economic development activity is led by government. Uh, the parastatals that you're supposed to get money from as business are government-led. Uh, your IDC's shareholder is DTI. Your DBSA, the chairperson, minister of finance, your PIC shareholders, you know. So your CIDA, your LIDA, your NYDAs, every institution where any business that has to go in and look for support, it's government driven. And there is a politician on top and there is a constituency behind it. And there are civil servants in there. Those that are appointed according to party allegiance. So they are told this is what we need to do. We need to empower our people. We need to give to the youth. We need to give this. That's why you find that government contracts are given to people who are not deserving of those contracts. It is about money. That's why you don't see any deliver. So it's very difficult for you to bite the hand that feeds you. Let us look at the issue here yeah, yeah, Zimbabwe, for example. When late President Mugabe stood up and dealt with the issue here, yeah, uh, taking the land back. South Africa applied quiet diplomacy. And you could understand that uh, South Africa, Pretoria hosts the largest, uh, second largest population here, the, here, here the diplomatic corps. And it was hailed as having the best constitution and it was President Mbeki who was the president then. But the business community in South Africa did not stand up to support or take advantage of the economic uh, uh, challenges that were in Zimbabwe to say, we'll partner with our Zimbabweans because we have spotted a business opportunity. Because funding came from government. You look at what is happening presently with what uh, former President Jacob Zuma is going through. Those that are standing and defending, they are defending because they benefited when President Zuma was president through government tenders and everything, empowerment that they've got from him. So they owe. You understand now if I use the spokesperson of the foundation, um, uh, to, not to mention the name, but I think we know who we're talking about. You look at the level of benefit because even the business that he bought, which is the communication agency, it was financed by the very same people that he bought it from. So what transaction is that? I want to buy your car, but you give me your money to buy your car. So whose car is it? You are basically legalizing the transfer of the car to me, but because I owe you, that car remains surety that if I don't pay you back, I will get my car back. So there is no genuity in, in, in all of it. 
So we are in a situation where even when something is wrong, we'll defend it because those that are being exposed of this wrong are the ones that have put us to where we are. The middle class in South Africa team today are because of government deployment and government tenders. Mm. Their children are at private schools, they are having bonds in these estates and everything. So you can't expect a person to stand up and he thinks, Ish, how am I going to pay for the house? How am I going to pay for this lifestyle? Because it is the very same government, it is the very same comrade who has set me up to be where I am. So I turn a blind eye for as long as I'm okay. So you forget that that has generational effect. Look at the decline now of the state of affairs in South Africa. Our economy is going down. Whether we like it or not, it is going down because investor confidence is not there. You can't have government as a driver of investment and invite the private sector to say, we have raised this much, come and play. Who is actually supposed to benefit there? Whose money is it? It is supposed to be private sector that says, we have raised money to do one, two, three. Can we have an enabling environment from government so that you can be a referee as government and say, this is what we want you to do as business. If you don't do it, we punish you. But how are you going to punish yet? You are the one who have raised the money. You are the one that has appointed them. You are the one that is even giving the criteria of how tenders are supposed to be given. So you run every, everything. <laughs> okay. So there will be no real change for as long as economic development is driven by government. Don't forget, governments help shape lives. It's five years. Mm. So in the third year, going to the fourth year, I'm worried now about my political position. So it is no longer about the agenda that I was driving. I get into a campaign mode. Let us look for a simple example, the railway infrastructure in South Africa. And who is the Minister of Transport? Uh, that's a disaster. Right now, the railway uh, you, you, in you South see. Africa, it's a has-been railway. It's a has-been railway. Because Zilliger, it's so let, me pose, let me pose another question for you. How many times have you written or you have read your colleagues written about the Muloto Road disaster? It's the most dangerous road in South Africa and still has not been improved. Exactly. But how many years have we been? Because remember, the PATCO system was brought in to ferry people outside of the city. Yes. Go to your homelands and come in. So you bring in labor and go back. So we are in government, but that status quo has not changed. So who is, who is fooling who here? You, you understand? We, we need to look into these issues and say, good people, it is our people that are dying on the Muloto Road almost every second week, if not every second day. We have spoken about it, the way to move them, it will be by rail. But what happened to the integrated cities? Why are we not bringing people closer to their workplace? Why are we not prioritizing people in the buildings in Swan? If you look at the city of Swan now, you have Bo, uh, Schubert Park and all this. They are not occupied. Why not build them and improve and bring the people that are supposed to shuttle into the city and give them priority of rent there? Stay closer to your workplace. Stay with your families. It is the disaster. But we are not doing that. Kalin and mine, Mziligas, has been shipping diamonds uh, to, to this day. But look at the Refilwe township next to it. Pretoria as a city has three car assembly plants. Ford in Silverton, BMW and Nissan in Roslin, but they are all surrounded by high employment rate. Show me one person who can afford driving a BMW or a Nissan in and around Sochangube and the surrounding areas, cars that are assembled here. Hmm. Who is benefiting from the social enterprise development of that? Mami Lodi, they produce Ford there, but you don't see Ford in the township of Yesteras and Mami Lodi. Who is benefiting from the corporate social investment of those financial institutions? Mm. 
we don't ask these questions because money accrues to those that are sitting as MECs for economic development, ministers of finance, and you can name it. So until government changes and the focus on being government and govern and the business drive the economic development as business, we'll see change. But we, we, we are not seeing it because what Black Business Forum and all that, you check, we have applied to government for funding, but you're supposed to be a government watchdog. You know what? what uh, uh, how are you going to do that? Mr. Mabo, what my worry is, South Africa always look at itself and worry about itself. And in the process, those who are, you know, surrounding the, the, the country, come in and want to partake on the very small slice that is there. I don't think Nzilika has been kicked out a little bit now, but I don't think we have, we have educated ourselves enough, probably like you have, to be able to, to learn more about how to contribute to the development of the other countries surrounding us, like you have done, moving out of South Africa and going to another country and, and, and being able to establish yourself in a manner that will also uh, benefit um, Africa. Maybe I can ask you and also uh, uh, Matume, what are the things that we should do to educate ourselves, not to only focus on our government? Because when we say VUCA Africa, it cannot be South Africa only. It has to be other countries only. And what will be our role in participating in this? Timbi, I've let, let's ask this simple question. You have asked about why are people not moving out of, uh, of South Africa and see that. Look at the, stra the, the strategy that has come and that we use. And I don't have, uh, please pardon me for using it as an example. No, no offense intended. Mm. We say township economy, right? You must rebuild the township economy and they have the township to be the townships to, to revive their own economies. But let us look at the plan. What were townships established for before? They were established to be labor dormitories, right? So if you reestablish the economy of the township, what are you going to, to use? Because you need to look at the full value chain of, of everything that you do. If someone is in a retail space, for example, uh, where are they getting their produce from? From The things that you sell on your shelf, where are you getting it from? It must be linked to a farm that produces. Who owns that farm, right? So we need to trace that line, that value chain, okay? We are having joints today uh, that sell expensive booze there. People go in expensive cars and everything. We have turned that into something that is glorified that for you to be seen as having arrived, you must drive this expensive car, you must drink alcohol at this particular joint, you must have a woman who is commodified in a bikini to be seen to have arrived, right? You are buying a bottle 24,000 and you are buying this and you are, you are fine. So how, where do you get that money to sustain that lifestyle? It has to be money that comes quick and you don't feel it. So it is linked to a tender, right? So what is the culture that we are breeding? There's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol. Lick it back to where the hops come from. Who owns that farm? If it sustains the value chain, you can be at the right end, Timbi, of drinking proudly because you are all benefiting in that line of having produced that, that booze. You, you get my point? So we are keeping people in this township. We are reviving the economies in these townships because we want to sustain our voters. We don't want to leave them. They, they should not leave. Give them enough, but not enough for them to always look up to you. Hmm. In South Africa, Tembi, it's not surprising. Go into the township. You'll find a 60-year-old who has never owned a passport. Hmm. A person who has grown up, grown up in Soweto, Tembi, who has never been to Pretoria. I'm not even talking about out of Gauteng. I'm talking about the next door cities. Mm. 
ask someone who is in Soweto and say I'm from Bushback Ridge, Mzelikas. You will, you will hear him, he will appeal up. <laughs> Where is that place? So, are you saying so if we are not exposing our people to the truth and say, we understand we come from a difficult past as South Africa. That is a fact. We had to equalize the situation by economic empowerment and the BE. But that was supposed to have had a timeline, right? To say, we will do this to this point. From this point, you should have been empowered to now take over. There needs to be transition. But you are grappling to continue to be a socialist country, not a developmental country. You are still giving people handouts, Tim, in South Africa today. No, we need to increase our grants. You are, you are creating, you are increasing dependency on government. That's why when you don't give, South Africans ban the infrastructure that is supposed to, government is not delivering. Okay, I hear you. You, you, you see where, where it is, the problem is. Yeah, so we need, to, we need to understand that if I have to quote from the Bible, the curse that happened in the Garden of Eden has not changed. We still have to eat out of the sweat of our foreheads. You are a mother, Timbi, and you remember the pain of, birth, of giving birth. It is out of that curse that you will give birth through pain. So until that is reversed, it means the status quo remains. You have to eat out of the sweat of your forehead, tilt the land and eat. You understand? So we need to in, inculcate that culture in our people to say, work. Where you need help, that help must be a bridge to help you move from that point where you are stuck into a level where you will be able to push and move forward. But because it will liberate your mind, and when something wrong happens, you will be able to say it's wrong. It can't be. Okay. In a country next door of us, I will not say which country for fear of mis being misquoted. Every time we go into elections, you get reminded of the liberation struggle. So remember, I have liberated you. Therefore, you owe me a vote. I still need to be here. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. I was asking a question. Actually, I was commenting that as South Africans, we always see ourselves as Africa. We, we always talk to African issues and, and always talk to, Af to South Africa without, because of probably not being knowledgeable about what is happening outside. You and, and, and Mabobo now can probably give all this example, and maybe uh, Matume can give these examples because you have traveled. But when we talk about Africa rising from the, from the South African point of view, examples that will always be given would be what South Africa is doing. All and all good, but I, I feel we are doing injustice in terms of identifying the gaps that, that eventually affect Africa, I mean, South Africa too. The Zimbabwean influx, which now is, it is said that there's more Zimbabwean in South Africa than in Zimbabwe, probably could have been managed well if we had not been so concerned about ourselves. What is your view in, in, in making sure, or what is your opinion on, or, or your input towards making sure that as, as South Africans, we also broaden our horizon, you know, get to know. Mr. Mabomo was saying, some people don't even know <laughs> Pretoria. You expect them to know uh, outside of the country. That would be too much to ask. But still, what is it that we can do towards this book of Africa and making Africa to rise for us to educate ourselves about what other countries around us are doing? When we get to know when Mozambique, there was this uh, issue of terrorists or whatever they call them. Uh, that's when we became, oh, Mozambique uh, actually still exists. Or there are people crossing the border around Bumalanga without, uh, without papers and somebody is doing some corrupt activities. What can we do? I think that's what, uh, you know, you, if you meet uh, uh, a typical American, okay? Yeah. Say, yeah, I'm from South Africa. So, ah, you know, how are the giraffes and lions up there, you know? Uh, is it next to Kenya or close to Kenya? No. We, we, 
we are losing who we are as a people. For us to know who we are as a people, we need to know our continent. Mm. If we don't know our continent, therefore we won't respect our fellow brothers and sisters because we don't know them. We don't know where they come from. Like if they're saying they're from Ghana, for example, we think like it's some, some other thing, like somewhere, somewhere. We don't even know what's the capital city of Ghana. And we don't even know who was the founding father of Ghana. Mm. Because this is how educated we are. So we are... lose, we are out of touch with reality. Like what Jab was saying, you know, um, I mean, the issue again is what Julius Nyerere said, he said, independence would be meaningless if a nation depends on gifts. In South Africa, freedom is, is meaningless because people depend on tenders and government to sustain themselves, to live a particular lifestyle. And they will do anything under the sun to defend that lifestyle that they are living, being offered to them by certain members of our government. They won't defend a principle. They won't defend a policy. They won't defend a building of a road or whatever, unless it's their tender. They're getting that tender. They will depend a particular issue because they benefit. It's not because it brings something to their people, to their community. Like I said to you, I refuse to go to January 8th because I was saying, but what have they done for us in my village? It was a matter of principle. Mm. It's not that I've turned my back on anything else. It's for me, it's a matter of principle to the point that I picked up the phone, I told the leadership, I said, look, I'm not coming. And these are my reasons I'm not coming. I'm not afraid to say it. I'm not afraid to voice it out because the issue is when we're struggling, during the struggle, we used to meet and we used to say, this is what we're gonna do when we get power. Now I can go back to them, I said, but remember when I was 15 years old, when we were meeting under the tree, this is what you said. But today we're doing something completely different from what you told me. So did you send me to go and lie to my people so that you can live better? I think, uh, um, again, politics of the stomach, people are being controlled, like Jabu said, because they want to be seen, to be eating, and they will defend the hand that is feeding them regardless. Mm. They will rather, for them, for them to see, like what Jabu was saying, for them to be posting on Instagram that they are drinking this whatever champagne that is worth so much, for them it's a status for them. It shows that, that they've arrived. For them to be posting, posting that they've got 20 cars parked outside their houses, for them it said they've arrived. For them, that's what life is all about. They forget that this life is about us as collective, as a country, moving forward. Mm. Yes, every country, every family will have those, uh, those uh, bad apples. But what for us, if you look, most if you go through most of the instagram photos and all of that whoever is posting something is linked to a particular politician it's said mm. it is said when there are kids out there who don't have five thousand rent shoes but you can spend hundred thousand rent every weekend drinking you can't buy one pair of shoes for one poor kid. And you, the kid that you know from your aunt's neighbor, you know that kid, you know that kid doesn't have shoes. You know that kid, the parents are not working, but it does not cross your mind to buy that kid a pair of shoes because you won't post, it's not, it's not, it's, people, uh, it's not uh, fashionable, you know? Yeah. It's, it, it's the saddest part of it that we, 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 we are out of touch with the reality. Mm. We need to, to go back to the drawing board. It's, who are we as South Africans? Let's start there. Let's forget about our brothers and sisters who are here. Who are we as South Africans? What contribution are we doing in our own 
communities. Mm. It's sad. It is, it is, it is very, it is true. It, because people don't travel. It's true. People don't know Pretoria. People don't know Bush Bakrish. Like, I have to explain myself, I don't know how many times, to people here in Johannesburg, where is Bush Bakrish? Mm. It's, it's sad. Yeah. Is that my bobo? You know, Tim, um, there is now this hot issue, yeah, the permits of uh, Zimbabweans that will not be renewed. Yeah. And you hear, hey, it's a crisis, hey, they are being sent back, and, 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 right? And when I was mentoring uh, the, the youth at NYDA, uh, I, I don't remember the years, but for three years I've been doing mentorship then. I said to them, when the issue of the continental free trade was coming in, I said, as South Africans and as a youth, we are surrounded by embassies. And we have embassies that are neighboring our countries. Have we ever gone there to say, what is it that we can supply to your country as South African businesses? Because we are training you to be entrepreneurs at NYDA, right? Yeah. But for me to be able to be sure that when I sell my commodities in Zimbabwe, for example, I will not be swindled. I suggested to them, partner with Zimbabwean youth that are in the country. Register the same entity in Zimbabwe, same directors in South Africa, same directors in Zimbabwe. Let the Zimbabwean entity be the receiving entity. Yeah. You have closed the issue of swindling. Now, Zimbabwe has got arable land, Tim. And one of the things which they said to me at NYDA is the NYDA jurisdiction focuses on South Africa. You cannot deal with non South Africans. I said, but that is short sighted. We are driving towards the continental free trade. What is important when you give someone money, it's a return on investment. Where I deploy it, it's not much of an issue. So if you give me money as NYDA, and I've partnered with my Zimbabwean partner, I deploy that money in a Zimbabwean farm where we produce, but the produce is exported back to South Africa where we sell. Does that not make trade sense? Mm. Okay. When Zimbabweans are going back, why are we not going back to them and say, good people, most of you have been working in restaurants, you have gained skills, you have done this. Can't we move now and exploit the hospitality sector in your country? I have this much to invest with you. Sure. You have farms there, then this farm will contract for them to supply us on this. It will lessen our, head, our overheads, right? Sure. That's what intra-trade is all about, yeah. cross-border trade. But we will be politicizing this and say, no, we are chasing. We can't go back to Zimbabwe because it's bad. Who has to rebuild an economy of a country? It's yourself. Mm. We elect government leaders for them to enable an environment. But in Africa, we elect government leaders so that they can run our economy and our lives. <laughs> and our lives. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. We elect and we say, ah, that's leadership. You forget that the minister who is sitting there is the one who was campaigning with you. You need to hold him accountable. Yeah. Chief, you said one, two, three. You are not delivering. We'll call you back. But you don't even see him. You know, it's a minister. You even kneel in front of, of that person. Mm. No, it can't be right. So let us look at the principles of continental free trade. Let us integrate. You know, I introduced a program when I was in South Africa, but it never took off. A day with the ambassador. Get the young people to sit with an ambassador of a country and understand the country they come from. That's economic diplomacy. Mm. You will know better about that country and develop interest of wanting to visit and do business in that country. Yeah. And that they will facilitate your move and your safety when you go into their country because they are there to push that particular agenda. Mm. We have bilateral agreements in South Africa that are signed to promote trade.
But when they come back, those bilateral agreements are sitting in Dirko, their position of government. It is supposed to be a business thing to say, good business people, this is what we have agreed to go in and do this. You are protected by these laws and these agreements. Mm. But no, it's gathering dust. This, you know, at DTI, I asked and they said, no, we have a database of people that go on a mission. So it means if I'm in a rural area and I don't have access to internet, I will never be on a government mission. We hear you. We, we, we take you, you see, that is where, unfortunately, we miss it. And I will repeat, Tim, for as long as economic development is driven by government, the status quo will remain in South Africa mm. and in Africa. Look, let me use one last example. How long have we been having SADC as a secretariat? <laughs> but have South, Southern African region integrated? Are we doing trade and business amongst ourselves? Not necessarily, no. Then what is the agenda of SADC? Well, what is their primary purpose? Compliance, probably. No, it's governance and integration yeah, and aligning the principles of the AU to regionalize them yeah. and encourage Mr. member states Mr. to Mabob. comply with that. Mr. Mabob, currently, yes, because ma those things are not being done, it becomes a compliance issue for it to be existing. It is existing, but, but it, does not, it does not do what it has been established to do. I mean, there was a young... Yes, that's my point. ...from SADC uh, youth. She was clearly explaining those kind of gaps that are existing. The fact that youth and the and the and the heads of state do not speak to each other the heads of state will take the decisions on behalf of the SADC youth and expect them to implement those kind of things you spoke about the cultural aspect the languages yesterday around 10 o'clock i had the, nine o'clock i had an interview with a gentleman from the united states of america and one thing that he said which hit me was you must learn to speak English with an accent of, of America. Then you must you would know that um, your doors will open up. And if we want the Africa to rise when we are not elevating our languages or even being able to talk languages that will allow us to be able to communicate amongst ourselves, are we are we really rising? There are talks about having Swahili as one of the common languages that needs to be spoken. What is it that is being done? And what is your view based on having traveled the 20 countries um, in Africa? Okay, um, I, let me, before I come to that, um, what Jabu was saying, like this morning I had breakfast with one of the ambassadors, like, you know, he called me yesterday, said, can we have breakfast, you know? So I went to Pretoria and then he asked me the same thing that Jabu was raising, like, what can we do? And, and I said to him, what I was saying, no, a, a day in a, 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 with, a, with an ambassador, we're doing it with primary school kids. We start from there. And then when you do a day with the ambassador, you bring different people from career guidance, you know, bring a teacher, bring a, yeah. a policeman, bring a farmer. Bring... So you show the kids, this is what when you grow up, you can be. You know, so and then the ambassador was so happy that of this idea that we're gonna do it. We're gonna introduce this thing next year. But this is an ambassador from a foreign country. He's trying to do something for South Africans, but our own politicians don't see that. Okay, that's that's Mr. point one. Okay. So we get to the issue, Mr. To the issue of the land, Mr. Mabo. The issue of the Sorry, Mr. Mabobo, I think there's a network issue. Mr. Mabobo, you spoke about you having initiated this ambassador program. Were there any outputs or outcome out of it? And is there a way in which you can collaborate with MZ for it to be resuscitated and make sure that, uh, because now MZ has opened that door, to make sure that that is resuscitated based on what you had initiated before? It is still alive, uh, Tim. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm in Zambia is because of that. Uh, that I said, no, look, this is what we want to do is regional integration. Can you facilitate that I go and present this? 
it was through the High Commission of Zambia that I found myself here. They are the ones that referred me to a government office and say, this is what he's saying. Please check and listen. We make sense of what he's saying. And when we presented this side, it, it resonated with the government of Zambia. So we are working. Mm -hmm. So even going back, there's still that relationship with the High Commission of Zambia. Mm -hmm. So I'm not scared to mention that. I was the founding CEO of ZMSA Forum. We have a good relationship with the embassy of Zimbabwe. So it is still there, you know? So these things can be done. It, it is not about, you know, you know the, the thing that is uh, killing us to be as black people. It's if I don't see myself taking the glory in this, then no one else will do it. We must look at the benefit part of it. Yeah. So it's very easy to collaborate. Today we have this virtual world. I don't have to be in SA to link Z with the network that is in SA mm. to do it. As long as it is being done, to share and say, this is what we had in mind, that it can it be aligned like this. And we share compare notes, it gets done. When one has an opportunity, it can even bring an exposure to say, let it not be in South Africa. Can they arrange and we host them here in Zambia? host them in Malawi, host them in the country of the ambassador's origin. Mm. So it is about exposure. So we can volumize it. I, I'm, I'm game. I, you have the contacts of Mzi. Uh, with his permission, I'll get them from you and you can share mine with him and we take it up. Because these things, we don't need permission. You know, this thing of let us first get clearance from government, it doesn't work. <laughs> you do it as long as, Tembi, what you are doing, you are not disrespecting or disregarding any law. Yeah. Then stick on that lane and do it. I wanted to say, like, on the issue of language, you know, yeah. if, if someone can blindfold you right now, blindfold you and take you into a mall for a whole hour, and then you come out of the mall, you will think that there were no black people in that mall. Because everyone in the mall will be speaking English. <laughs> that is so true. That's the problem with us. That's the problem with us. We, when we are together, how do we speak English when we are together? You can, I, I know Tsonga, Nablabula, Kabua, Nabachibenda. So why do we have to speak English when we are together? But when you go to the mall, what are people speaking? They're speaking English. Mm. Why? Are we ashamed of our languages? What is that? I will not indoctrinated to, to think that speaking English is actually elite and it makes you better than others. And when you have the accent, like the gentleman yesterday was saying, um, once they hear you speaking with an American accent, the doors open for you. So people practice these things in order for doors to open for them, for them, which is a culture that probably needs to change. That's the, I, I know about that. You know, I, I was one of the students who got this scholarship by the like, um, State Department in America, you know? Yeah. You go there, and if you look on their wall, the students that have been part of the, Previous students who have been part of the State Department at this uh, it's called foreign exchange program by the State Department. Most of them come back and become president in future years. Then we start asking ourselves, how are they funded? How was the campaign funded? It starts from there. Mm. When they're in America, they realize they speak good, they've got good accents. They pick them up, fund their campaign they become presidents of countries. And whose policy are they going to be introducing when they are in power? It's not their policy. Mm. It's an agenda by their masters. Mm. That's what the problem is. So I was part of that. I came back, I still have got my own African accent and on our own change. <laughs> how, do we, how do we educate our, our, our young people and our children to, 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 what is the word, to sort of um, embrace, embrace the fact that speaking in Benek is not, in indigenous language, is actually not a bad thing. It's actually good. I think I'm also guilty of that. <laughs> I was so, 
it is simple. We start by being proud of who we are, mm. proud of what we have, proud of our culture, our tradition, and everything. So as long as when you give birth, your son is not uh, is not Thomas or Michael. So son is Mkatego, uh, Tabelo, uh, Mashodi. We are, we are getting somewhere. As long as your son is Michael, is uh, Gladys, is uh, <laughs> is uh, Fenes or whatever you call our we call our kids these days. Those kids they, they talk, they look themselves as that, you know, mm. and that's what the thing that we uh, we as parents we set the tone when our kids are born by what we do to them as soon as they are born. Mm. We set the tone on how their life is gonna be. Uh, that's why, to a certain extent, although some we do have our beautiful names, although we do have some funny names that you it then said us ask yourself, why do you name your son, your child Matakala? You knowing what it means. Mm. Why do you name your child Mashatin? Knowing you know exactly what Mashatin means. <laughs> The names that you've got. Why do you then call your, your daughter Matlakala? It's like that. You know, we, you set the tone when that child, you're naming that child Matlakala, mm. or naming, naming that child Nimbini, for example. Yes. Exactly. You know, mm. so, those are the things. Yeah. We, we as a parent, we jinx our kids. Mm. at birth mm. so those are the things that we need to look look back back in the days back in the old days kid was not named immediately after he or she is born yeah wait for the days they have to think what will this child be called now this one they are born five minutes later not even before you're born you've got a name already your parents have prepared a name. If it's a boy, it's going to be Michael. If it's a girl, it's going to be Agnes. You know, they've already done that. But in the old days, it was not like that. The father had, had seven days to think, what name am I going to give this child? And why am I giving this child that particular name? Yeah. We have a long and we, so. and we lost it. Yeah. We have and a why we lost it? Because we said it's, it's useless, but it was useful. Mm, mm, mm. The side effect of that thing that we thought is useless, we can see it generations later. Yeah. I have a, I have a Christian name they call it too. <laughs> my middle name is English, so yeah. But I didn't call my, I didn't give my son any. Uh, you've got African no, my kids. Uh, no one in my house has got my daughter. My firstborn has got the English name, which is Fidel, which was she was named after Fidel Castro. That's it. Uh, that's the English. She, her name is Fidel. She was named after Fidel Castro. Fidel that's, the, that's the only one with an English name. Uh, the rest of my kids have got African names. Mm, okay. Okay. Back to your album as we wrap up. I just want to pick your brain on track one Africa up until the end how you have collaborated with so many uh, artists from different countries uh, well known for that matter uh, yeah you can name them yourself because uh, i think it will be good for people to have this album they really need to listen to this one but i just want to check what was going through your mind as you write track one up until track you know, because there's a place, there's one that speaks about lying, uh, and there's another one that, uh, that, yeah, let me not go into details, but each and every one is unpacking the struggles that we're still experiencing as, as people and also as African, irrespective of race. Um, because we like it or not, as much as we'd like to, have, to, to make this whole thing a black story, but we have these white people in our country and we cannot say they are not part of the Africa that we want to have. 
we just want the slice of the of the bread that they are probably um, having alone. What what what? For, okay, for me the whole album, as much as rise, also I was also trying to show my other brothers and sisters that we can stand together and do a good thing. That's why I work with different musicians from across Africa. For, for example, song number one, I work with Poloja, who's from Swaziland. Mm. Song number two, I work with Pilar Lozi, he's from KwaZulu Natal. Mm. Song number three, I work with uh, Hishishi Papa, he's from Namibia, and Mami Von Chaka Chaka. Song number four, I work with Prenam Tambo. Uh, song number six, I work with uh, uh, Femi Koya, he's from Nigeria. Mm. Song number seven, I worked with Zina Edwards. She's based in, in England. Uh, Vusam Kaya is a Zimbabwean who's based in Austria. And Ka uh, Kanyuma Pumolo, who's a South African. Song number um, nine, Gieza, I worked with Soweto Gospel Choir. And Oluse, she's a Zimbabwean born, but living in, uh, in, um, in, in, in England. Mm. So it looked like song number 11, uh, uh, one day, I work with Lami. She's from Ghana. So you can go through this album. You can see, I try to say, we can come together, work together. I've got Salif Keita on the song, We're All Africans. Mm. It's from Mali. So this album has got different musicians. I've got Omoja with Kambimoto from DRC. Mm. So I've got... Uh, Farina Kutano, which is, has got Kinda uh, uh, Kuyati from Senegal. I've got Botsadva from Central African Republic. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I've got all these musicians from all over Africa because I'm saying united, we can do better and be great. That's why we've got a song called Umoja, which means unity in Lingala. We've got We Are All Africans. We've got um, uh, uh, we've got Masbiele um, Masusin, which means let's go back to our roots. We've got Africa with Bologna. So we've got a lot of things that we can do as Africans, as long as as long as we can hold hands together and stand for what we believe in. Africa can be great again. Africa has always been great, but we, there's somewhere where we, we drop the ball and we need to pick it up mm. for Africa to rise again. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Mzeli Kazwa Africa, um, the musician, the uh, journalist, the cultural activist, <laughs> and you name them, the poet and, and, and so forth. If you, you do not know the album that we're talking about, it's called Rise. And we invited him to our transforming just to talk about these issues that affect Africans. And I believe you will learn quite a lot by also listening to this music. I learned quite a lot too. Um, I love the song Voka, like I've said initially. So Mzi, thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll hope to meet you again. I think for me, the take home is all of us have got the role to play. All of us can, uh, you know, participate in building the Africa or that we want to have. Um, but it has to start with me making a difference in the small way that I can within the small community that I stay in. And it grows to become a bigger thing because all of us will be doing the same thing at the same time. And indeed, if we, can use, if we can use our social platform to educate ourselves yeah. instead of showing, showing off how much booze we can drink, what cars we can drive, Africa will go somewhere. Thank you. That is so, so, so true. That is so true because we're creating a culture that we may not necessarily be able to maintain. And, you know, drunkards for that matter, we, we're creating people that are going to be drunkards and not being able to take responsibility and leadership roles as expected. You know, I really appreciate your, your, your time and having taken time to be on our platform. It will be injustice for me to uh, close this session without, you know, playing this song. Oh Just God. listen for a few minutes before we... Family was the core of heart security and sense of belonging. 
Now look to your neighbor for help when the family pillar begins to chip and crumble. No, they too wear a mask of strange false contentment, but cry for solutions to family troubles. On the street, people take the lives of others, yet you remain silent. What holds your tongue? Your sisters and brothers across the borders, neighbors still suffer tyranny, war, poverty, and starvation. If you close your eyes to their faces of woe, close your ears to their lamentations of suffering, turn your backs on their health, you need to face the worries of home and your own house and home. And where is your voice of intolerance? Yo, I always have good bumps every time we play this. <laughs> Thank you so, 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 so much. I really appreciate it. Um, have a lovely day. Same to you and have a cross a good festive. Thank you. Bye. Mm. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and also follow and like our LinkedIn and Facebook page. See you next time.